So welcome everyone. Today we have uh, Professor Daniel Vucic. He's a special person for our institute because uh, he was awarded PhD here after receiving before a master's degree at the Warsaw University, of, um, which was given for his work on a young Mills equation. After CFT, he moved to United States. We were working with Vyazinski. Yes. Well, my, my main boss was Bob Dorfman, and then I worked with Frederick Svitanovich, but my most famous work with Chris Yes. yes. <laughs> well cited work, I would say. Uh, also, then you came, uh, then you came back uh, to Poland. Uh, he received his habilitation at the Neighboring Institute, the Institute of Physics. But now he is actually a leader laboratory at Nenski Institute of Experimental Biology. So he was moving actually during his career to physics, informatics, and uh, biology, neurobiology. So now we have him here, uh, and Daniel, the screen and the floor is yours. So please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Krzysztof, for the kind introduction and for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, I might say uh, an anecdote. There's a law, I don't I forgot the name of this law, which says that essentially you rise up in the administration until you hit the maximum level of your incompetence. So I was already employed in, in Brno Technical University in engineering and electronics department. I am now, as you can see, also in the Department of Management and Social Communications. So I think the government is the last thing which remains. I mean, maybe I won't get there. <laughs> so uh, yes, let me just start with, with some uh, thanks to the Nesky of Experimental Biology and the Agilian University, which hosts me within this uh, FNP Teamnet Bionet project. Uh, so here are all the logos required by the, by the funders. And my, my plan was a little ambitious for today. So I thought I would start with a description of general activity. So what I call the kinematics of spy trains, which I presented here a, a few years ago. I don't think anybody remembers. So I thought that would be useful. And then I wanted to move to the infinity cages, discuss kinematics of mice behavior, which uses the same mathematics, and then show how we include reinforcement learning, and then talk about social aspects and show example results. But as I was preparing the slide, I realized that this is overly ambitious. So the first part is gone. I mean, somebody was really counting on this, which was in the abstract, I can still deliver this, but it's going to be gone. And I also have to give a disclaimer. This is the first time that I'm presenting those results. So, uh, you know, the, the uh, notation might be a little fluid and not everybody is Polish, but uh, I thought that that would be of interest to you. So that's why I say to, to select this stuff. Okay, so this is an IntelliCage. I would say in general, there is a tendency in biology this day to, to move towards high group and uh, studies and analysis. It's like in physics, you know, people used to do small experiments and then they moved into a bigger facilities. It's like you look at CERN and, and the cyclotrons, you've got a uh, huge teams of people with which analyze tons of data. And in biology, they try to do this in many different aspects, and they are all you, you, you heard at least about genomics, proteomics, stuff like this. In behavior, it's starting to change recently. So here's an example of an automatic cage. IntelliCage is just a proprietary name. So this cage allows uh, up to 14 mice to, to be housed in the same place, and they live here for weeks. So that's a bit more ecological. You don't have, I mean, in normal behavioral studies, the mice live in some animal house, and just for the experiment, you bring them to a cage. They do some tests for, for an hour or two and they go back to the experiment. So there's a lot of human uh, handling involved and, and here just don't have it. So what you have, there is, there is food delivered here to the mice and there are four automatic corners and in every corner you have two bottles and the bottles can uh, provide water or they can provide sweet water which the animals like or they can provide water with quinine which is bitter so the animals won't like it or they can provide alcohol so you can test and addiction and things like that. Okay, so that's what the corner looks like. So a mouse, if it wants to get a drink, it just has to make a nose poke. So it sort of presses the button to open the door and then it can get access to the, the bottle. Okay. And the nice thing is that the mice have some uh, RFID transponders under their skin so that you always know which mouse is going for a drink. And moreover, this is all programmable. So you can say, but you, know, you want to allow the mouse to 
get a drink in one corner, but not in another one, and things like that. And that's what that's critical to design some interesting experiments. And I'll show you some examples of that. And by the way, if you have any questions, uh, please stop me on the way. I like to be interactive. And also, if I speak too fast, please stop me because you do speak too fast. <laughs> so I will. I need to find myself. <laughs> I mean, Professor Turski wrote me yesterday that he can make it today. So I'm, I'm very sorry, of course, that he's going to miss it, but I mean, I shouldn't be so tense. It's, uh, <laughs> but it's always coming, coming here, so, you know, brings the nice memories of my, my times as a, as a PhD student. Okay. So the case is, is understood, I hope. So just uh, by way of illustration, let's look at the simple experiment. So imagine we have those four corners. And in, in, let's imagine that at the beginning, we provide water in every corner, okay? And you have these mice, and then once they learn that every corner is equivalent, you start providing sugar in one of the corners. And the question is, you know, will they learn? How quickly will they learn? Okay? So this is the typical uh, description of the experiment, okay? I call this uh, colored spikes. Or it's, it's a raster plot. So every row, is a representation of the dynamics of one mouse. Okay, so every dot is just the moment when the mouse entered the corner, and the color describes the the corner number. Mm -hmm. So already looking looking at this picture, you can see. I mean, can you see something of interest? Does anybody see anything? I mean, so, I mean you know the description of the cage, and you see this picture. Some are a little bit more open than others. Okay, so yeah. which ones are a little bit more open? Three hours period, so they sleep, right? Yes, I mean, so one thing is we see variation in activity, right? I mean, this seems to be more dense, and this seems to be less dense, right? Mm -hmm. So probably they are sleeping here more often than they do here, right? That's one thing that we see, okay? And the other thing that we see. So that's what Marek said, Marek. So which corners are more, po more popular? The blue. So blue is more popular. Everybody agrees with that. Okay, what about here? Okay, it's still thinking blue. Okay. So I think that you know what happens is that initially the blue is most popular, but but the popularity of that grows as the time goes on. Right. So how do you how can you think about this? I mean, so a, a simple, I mean, so first, there's a general discussion about, you know, you, you've got this kind of picture, and the question is, you know, what is the relevant information contained in this picture? Okay, so you might say, okay, the only thing which matters is the average activity, okay? So you could represent by a single number, but I guess most of us would agree that this is a too drastic reduction, right? On the other hand, you might say, well, every entry matters. So this would mean that if I wanted to explain the results of this experiment, I would have to provide every number. And that would seem to be a little excessive. Right, so the question is you now, what is the middle ground? How much information do I have to provide and how much can I skip? So this is our goal in a way. We would like to find, I mean, I call this kinematics because I'm interested in finding the language to just to talk about this data. And then of course you would like to have mechanics so try to understand like what are the mechanisms behind this or like what can matter. Okay, so what we see here, uh, this is say it's the, daily average activity of all the mice, the whole population, okay? So just the thick blue line is just the average activity of the whole population. And then here you see uh, the standard error of the mean. And on top of that, I have just superimposed the conditional probability, which tells you, okay, so, so the black lines tell you what is the probability that you're going for a drink. And the red line tells you what is the probability that if you go for a drink, you will actually go for sugar. Okay, so you can see that the mice in this case actually started from 0.2, and the reason is that actually the corner where you provide sugar is the one which is the least popular initially because there's always some little variability, right? Should be one fourth, but it's usually one is a little less popular. So you can see they start from about one, uh, one fourth, and then there is just some trend. So they actually learn, and then it, eventually the probability to go for a drink to the Red corner is, is about uh, 0.6. Okay, so this is just to illustrate sort of the kind of data uh, that you're getting, but I want to, you know, throughout the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on an experiment which was done uh, last year by our colleagues at the Institute of Pharmacology, Polish Academy of Sciences, 
class in Krakow. Uh, those are people from the group of Professor Jan Rodriguez Parkitna. Uh, and uh, the modeling has been done by Bartosz Jura and Michał Renacy for my postdoc, my postdocs in this Bionan projects in, in the Gelenian University. Okay. So we have these mice. In fact, we have 14 mice, but only seven are shown here. There are those four corners, and the blue color indicates water. The pink color indicates a reward, and the green color indicates reward. Now, the reason that they are presented uh, differently is that we have two groups of mice. Okay, so what you are interested in was to see if there is a social effect on learning. Okay, there's a tendency in this system, you know, for the experiment, that's when they started using this, was to assume that each mice are independent. Okay, and we know that the idea of gas is a great example, but it does not describe all the phenomena that you see in physics. Turns out in biology is the same. But the question is, you know, how to show that actually, you know, the social effects matter, it's not so obvious. So what we did in this experiment is we have 12 mice which are in the majority group and two mice which are in the minority group, okay? And then they go like this for two days and then we switch this. And then the corners also change, okay? So imagine that you are you now coming every day to the CFT and every day you go for lunch and once every few weeks you go for a cafeteria and they say, sorry, today we don't serve you and you have to find a different place, okay? And the, the, the idea is that so, so we assume, we speculate that these guys, they are able to learn what is the reward. And this is part of the information they have, but they also stop look at the others, which corners are mostly visited. It's like for you, so you might have a tendency to always go to a specific bar, which some of you like, you know, for ages, you've always been going there since your PhD studies days. But then you see that everybody else is going to the other side of the street. So you might one day decide, okay, let's give it a try, okay? So the thing is that, you know, if you are in the majority group, and the social cues actually help you. But if you are in minority group, actually they are confusing. Okay, so say you've got this mouse and you just move into a corner and then it may drink the water or it may drink suffering, okay? And then we associate some reward with this. So we say if it drinks water, I mean, it just goes, you know, so it's thirsty, so it just drinks a little bit. It's not really rewarding. But if it goes for suffering, you know, it just needs, uh, a boost. And then we assume also that, you know, once it leaves the corner, it somehow uh, propagates some social information to the other animals. We don't know what that is. This could be propagated by smell, or maybe they just observe it. Okay, this mouse is just this, this corner. And we assume that there is no, no detail in this information. Like, we don't know if the mouse says, no, oh, this was, this was great. It's just, we see, okay, the mouse was there. And then, further to make this symmetric, I mean, as symmetric as we can, given the setup, okay? Because the setup always uh, imposes some some limitations. That we can do is in every corner, in every corner, the um, only one bottle is available for a given mouse. Okay, so if this mouse is a is a majority mouse, when it has access to reward in its corner, and in every other corner it has access only to water, okay? And the minority mouse sees the same. It will just see, will just get access to the to the green reward color and to the water in the other three colors. So that's symmetric. Okay, so that is that clear? That's a double experiment. Okay. So th this is just how generally you think about it. Now let's let's complicate these things a little bit. Okay, so just to give you some idea of what the experimenters are facing, right? Because so it, it's very easy for a theoretician to say, okay, just give me some data, I'll explain it to you. And we tend to discard the the, the challenges in the experiment. Okay, so in this case, you have, say, four days of adaptation. Now, the red triangles indicate closed bottles, and the yellow triangles indicate water available in the corner. Okay, so you've got these 14 mice at the beginning, and they just explore the cage, and they, they find out that in every corner, only one bottle is going to be available, and there's water everywhere. And then you flip it, and you provide it from the second bottle in the same corner, okay? So say the mouse, the mice, learned how this whole thing operates. And then what you do is you start providing reward in every, in, in, for a different bottle, okay? And again, every mouse has the access to the same, to the same reward, okay? So in this, you know, until here, until here, the social cues are actually helpful. So the mice let you know, 
I can find out on my own where the reward is. But actually, you know, if I have difficulty, you know, remembering, it's good enough to follow the others, and they will show me where the reward is. Excellent. And once they once they sort of get used to that, we we start to make things difficult for them. So then we just split them into two groups, and there is a majority and minority. And again, what happens? You can see that the corners which are available to the majority, so I mean, these two corners with water are available to all of them. But in the rewarded corners, in this guy, only majority gets access to the to the sugar, and the minority gets the water. And in that corner, uh, the minority gets the sugar, and the majority gets the water. Okay. So this is symmetric, and then you know we just rotate this to make this more difficult for the mice, but also to get some information of what happens. Okay. So again, I'm just showing some some. Uh, realization of the data is just a piece of the data so that you know you could see something because the whole experiment is taking like 48 days of continuous mice living in this in this cage and I'm just showing two days okay so we see we have different mice from the majority group so numbers 2 to 13 and we have two mice number 0 and 1 from the minority group and you can see I mean the, the, the columns are colored in the same way so you can see the majority have no has no problem to remember that red is the rewarded corner. Okay. Daniel, yes. Probably we lack uh, for several days this uh, mice must be fed also somehow just to survive. Okay. Somehow. So I didn't mean, get it. Sorry. They get some food. Some food. Yeah. Yeah. The, the food is in the center. So they. Okay. So they not need it. Interfere with this uh, with the crazy quark. Yeah. No. I mean there is. So that they are not starved, there is I mean, no problem. I mean, the food is always in the center. Whenever they want to eat, they just eat. Okay. Whenever they want to drink, they just drink. It's just the water is divided to the corners. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you know, you might go, go for sweets. So, you know, yeah. if you have a sweet too, you have to find your corner. Excuse me. So if I understand correct, so the bottles for the minority and majority groups are uh, closed or open selectively, well, uh, depending on which mouse is approaching the important. That's correct. I mean, so you got, so you know, you, in the corner, you got the doors. So you have to make, like I said, you have to make this no spot. So press the button yeah. and then the doors open right. and this is the access. So they are, but to do this, you actually, you can find out what is the mouse which is approaching this, okay? Mm -hmm. So you come here, you know, they have this, this credit card, the, the chip, and you say, ha ha. And they open this Sorry. or they don't open Exactly. So that's why they can be at the same uh, mm -hmm. place uh, at the same time, like in the same, uh, both groups are mixed uh, in the same page. Yeah, yeah. So, so you've got the majority and minority in the same group, and you just control. You can you can say, you know, I, and only one mouse at a time can enter a given corner. Okay? Again, you know, I'm mixing them a bit the experiment with the, with the theory. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is what you would like to have in practice. I mean, we see that sometimes, you know, if they are very persistent, you know, they can enter. But I mean, we cannot explain no, everything at the same time. No, I mean, like 99.99 percent is only one mouse in the corner. So I I missed actually yesterday yes. actually how did you distinguish in majority and minority? You design. So what you do is every mouse has got a chip under its skin. Okay. So like each of you, I say you know it's number one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? and I say okay this week you and you are going to be a minority and the rest is going to be a majority. They are you don't know. different. Sorry? They are character the same or like the mouth is. They're all the same. It's like, it's like, I mean, are you the same or are you different? That's one of the challenges, okay? I mean, they are not. They only receive different key, right? This key is now opening only this yes. door. Yes. And... Yes. But the point I wanted to make right now is there is a little more to that. It's just that, you know, the mice are not ideal particles, right? I mean, they are not electrons. That's one thing which makes it, you know, more intriguing or more complex in a way, right? I mean, so in, in a sense, as a physicist, I'm approaching this as a physics problem. Okay, are some of them born leaders? The, 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 uh, that, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. There is a speculation that yes, there's a speculation that in the groups like this, national hierarchy is formed. Actually, uh, a seminar given by my other postdoc uh, just this Tuesday was showing this. I, I have not included this part. Mm -hmm. We sort of have two different approaches to modeling this. I'm showing. One approach which does not show this hierarchy for me, but it is it is possible. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we see mice. That is, so there's one one say mouse number seven in this cohort seems to be influencing half of the mice. So, so mm -hmm. you know, 
they, well, they make decisions based on what they learned based on the reward. They make decisions based on their own behavior in the sense that their own behavior is uncorrelated. So sort of there is a tendency that if last time I was at corner one, this time I'm not going to go to the corner one. So there is this sort of self-learning effect. And then they also seem to follow some other mice. And it seems that mouse number seven is the most often followed mouse. And interestingly, mouse number eight, just, just by accident, is the mouse which is the most often avoided in the sense of the correlation. So, you know, if you see that last time mouse number eight was in this part, I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but it's identical because, for example, the mouse the number 12, she is always uh, having this green thing. I don't know. Yeah. Less intelligent or more. That's a very good question. No, no, that's a very good question, right? I mean, you know, a mouse can be stupid, right? Or it might have a bad day, right? Or maybe they don't have much sugar. That's, I mean, I, again, I'm not going to go into the search. So, in my talk, I'm actually following, I'm actually focusing on what is common for the mice. And so, the other talk is more focusing on what's the difference between the, between the mice. So like, there is one mouse which seems to be a total outlier to the extent that our experimental colleagues. Well, that's, okay, guys, you need to throw this mouse away because it's just not learning what it's going to be. Okay. Now, what, what it turned out is sort of, you know, once we, once we sort of took this into it, I mean, you know, because, you know, if you want to show something and you've got mouse, which is, you know, maybe just, uh, you know, just doesn't get the idea of the sugar, right? I mean, it's sort of difficult to analyze it. I mean, it might be questionable, but, you know, how do I approach this? What we found out is actually this mouse was not learning the reward, but it was actually, I mean, when you look into how it learns the social signal, its performance was actually getting to the level of the other mice. But again, it's, it's a different talk. It's a different talk. So, uh, may I have one more? Yes, sure. So uh, during the experiment, do you change the assignment, which is the minority or, or majority? Exactly. Is it always the same group? Exactly. No, no, no. So it's like, you know, so like, you know, these two gentlemen, I mean, say they are in the minority for two days, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the next day, you know, it's, it's the two ladies, which are the minority. Okay. And these two guys come back to the majority group, okay? And the point is that, you know, you, you are the demigod. Okay? I mean, you have the and control. You at, the, at the relevance of sex. They're all uh, females in this case. Oh, right. Yes, no, I mean, having mixed sexes is a very good idea because then, you know, you want to end up with the same number of mice at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> One thing. No, I mean, this is a very serious issue. I mean, I know that all the experiments always make sure that these mice you know, are, are single sex, right? And I know the stories that, you know, sometimes we make a mistake, right? And then, you know, we have to throw away all the data. Uh, and then you might ask, okay, why females, why not males? I mean, the males just tend to fight. <laughs> it seems like you know the things that we as theoreticians sort of don't think about, right? I mean, also by the way, if you work with, with I don't know accelerators or solid state, you know, experiments, I mean, I, you don't have transistors fighting each other, right? I mean, this, this, uh, uh, I mean, there, there were papers, there were papers that you get different results of behavioral studies depending on whether it's a man or a woman handling the animals. So, you know, this is quite critical. But because it doesn't, in that case, doesn't it somehow cast some doubt uh, on the results if they are dependent on this, with the experiment data? How, 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 how well, this the experiment is done automatically. That's one of the advantages, yes. That's right. That's a limit. Yes. No, no, I was not referring to that experiment. I understand. I understand. No, it's, a, it's a fair question. It's, but, you know, it's a different discussion and it's a deep discussion. It's a, it's a deep discussion. There are questions of like, you know, what is so what is reality, what is true, you know, how do we ID? I mean, because it's also a fact, right? I mean, if you if you know something that say the animals are less stressed if they are handled by a woman than if they are handled by the by the man. And again, you look at on, on average, right? Because actually, you know, women have stronger menstrual cycles, but also females have uh, menstrual cycles. I mean, like my, my, my females have menstrual cycles, and that also may affect that sometimes affects the, the experiments, right? So you might say, okay, this complicates my experiments. Does not mean you should not do the experiments? I mean, this is part of the reality. If this is that part of reality, you want to understand that you cannot ignore it. Okay. You have to face it. And so on. So, you know, it's, so we are touching a number of different issues. And so we have to say at some point, okay, those are the issues I ignore. Those are the issues I accept. I'm going to face it. So for me, I'm going to, you know, in this talk, I'm going to focus on how the mice might learn. 
And specifically, you know, can I somehow disambiguate the individual uh, contribution and social contribution? So again, this is the representation. Do we have another question? Okay, so we have the representation of the majority group and the minority group. And again, this is what I showed you before. Uh, so the gray line, which is not perhaps very well visible, is the daily activity, same thing here. So you can see, okay, so this is, by the way, this is this is night because the mice are nocturnal animals, okay? So the higher activity during the night and the lower activity during the day, higher during the night, lower during the day. And then we see that clearly the red corner, which is the rewarded corner for the majority is the most popular with the probability reaching 0.6. Interestingly, you might notice that there is this peak during the minimum activity, especially constant our earlier work, where we notice that the mice usually prefer to go for sugars when they are most sleepy. Mm -hmm. So, so you, know, you wake up at night and say, okay, I want some sugar. <laughs> um, right, and, and so you see that, you know, the, these guys learn that the red is the rewarded corner and the blue is the rewarded corner for, for the minority. So they seem to be quite successful in learning that. And despite the possible confusion. And then you see that some of the other three corners in, in, the, in both of these cases, they seem to be similarly popular. Although I would say, looking at this group, the black one seems to be, uh, say, I would say significantly less popular than the red one, which seems to be significantly more popular than the other. And then you can compare them. And so here is just some comparison when you look at how the mice learn their own corners. So you can see that. That the red is the same curve that you see here, and the blue is the same curve that you see here. I mean, with those with those solid solid circles. So, so you know, just looking at this, it seems that the majority has somewhat higher probability to go for Swiss than the blue. Would you agree with me? So, like systematically, the red curve predominantly lies above the blue curve. So, it's, so you know, to my eye, it looks that the the, the majority lens a little better. So that might be this sort of social pooling, pooling mm -hmm. okay? So like the majority sort of pulls a little bit up, and for minority, this pooling is, is lower. And actually, this is this is a comparison of how they learn the other group corner. So what you see here is, so you know, this, this blue line with open circles is just how often the majority goes to the corner, which is rewarded for the minority, okay? And, uh, and this red line with open circles, it just shows how often the minority goes to the corner reward for the majority. So you might say how often they were confused by the other groups. And then you can see that the red one is higher than the blue one. Okay, so it seems but you know, and this is for minority. So you see that the probability that the minority group goes to the majority group corner is higher. So they are more often confused than the uh, when the majority group is being confused by the minority. Okay, makes sense. But at some moments of the day, uh, the two curves uh, interchange. Yes, I mean you know this. This is just uh, you know two two days mm -hmm. from the whole forty-eight days sure. experiment, okay? And this is just a single cohort, right? So you know you have to think about this statistic. Now, the problem is of course that this is so-called typical picture, which means the only one where everything goes you know according to what you expect, right? So. I don't have the pictures for showing all of the data because, uh, I mean, we, we don't generate them automatically and it would be just uh, difficult to represent all of this. But when we, when we look at the data, you know, there's a lot of variability. I mean, the mice behave different on different days when it's not changing the corners. It turns out that they have some biases. So, for instance, you know, the food might change, but you still want to go to Barbie Drone. Right? So, you know, even, you know, I mean, you used to go there. You, you still go okay so 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 it's it's complex so the question is you know, how can you how can you build the language to describe this and some sort of statistical approaches and would allow you to get some better deeper insight into this all I showed you so far is just data analysis right it's really exploratory data analysis I haven't shown any theory right you might say okay that's that's nice because you, you hear about this for the first time but but you know where's the theory so I don't know if I'm going to show you the theory but now I'm going to throw some mass into you just to make you happy, and I hope you you, you will enjoy it. I, I do. I mean, I think that this is interesting. Okay, I've got a problem with this figure. Every time I reformat it, reformats back, but in a different way. Anyway, 
So I'm going to introduce the kinematics for my behavior. Okay, so you've got this mice I'm just showing, say, n is the number of mice, t is the time of experiment, say 48 hours, not seven mice. And then I assume that as mice move, move on, then you're getting some information from sensors. So these sensors might be the mouse i and the corner k, or the mouse i and the corner k and interacted with bottle l. And you might have more because there's, there's more sensors. So essentially, you can you can look at the cage and you might say that you know every time something happens, it's just the state of the system which is being changed. And then this means that you have a dynamics because you can look at the changes of the state of the system, which is as complex as you wish, depending on how how faithfully you you track this. You can you can look how it changes in time. So for now, for the, I mean you can do it at different degrees of, of complexity, but I just want to focus. On the lowest level description. So I assume that the mouse can be in a state one to four, which is the corner number, say one to three, four, or it's outside the corner. So I, I say it's in the arena and I give it number zero. Okay, so a mouse can take one five states. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now what is the trajectory? I mean the trajectory depends on you know what what sort of you can observe in the system. Now the system I can observe, you know, when the mouse enters or leaves. So I say, okay, I have the times of the events. I start the first time is zero, and then sort of I enter a corner, I leave a corner, I enter a corner, I leave a corner. Those are my event times. And as I zero is just the initial state, sort of the mouse was either in the arena or in some corner. And then I just, you know, the SIJ is just the new state. So say, let's say I was in the arena at time zero, and then at time TI1 equal to say a minute and a half, I enter corner one. Then this becomes state one and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, then I want to talk about the history of mice behavior up to time t. So the history of mice behavior is just all of the event times. Right, let's just start from zero and all of the all of the states until the current time, obviously. And the point is that you know I presume that uh, you know when I think about this as a probabilistic model, then it must be history dependent. Because at any moment in time, when I look at this, you know, whether I will have as a mouse propensity to go to corner one depends if I was there before and if I saw there is sugar in this. Because if I was there a few times and there was always the sugar, then I, my probability to enter there is going to be higher than if I never visited this. Okay, so this is so the, the language we, which we are using here is, is called mark point processes. Okay, so point process is just this you know collection of times. And the marking is just those states. So I keep when, when I describe describe the neural activity, that's what I speak. You only look at the times of spikes. And here you just sort of travel between different states. And then you know they are not you know random in the sense that there are some rules. So for instance, you know that from a state k okay, bigger than zero from the corner, you can only move to arena, right? Because I mean there's no teleportation. And if you will, you may consider quantum mice, but it's not practical for, for the description. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, you know, there can only be one mouse in any state k bigger than zero. But obviously, in the state k equal to zero, there may be any number of mice from uh, 14, right? So not arbitrary again, right? Because, you know, at, at worst, you know, all the corners are taken, and then there are still 10 mice left, etc. Yes. There's times when something happens to some mouse are uh, different from mouse to mouse. Obviously. So this uh, this uh, second condition is implemented with some tolerance in, uh, in the difference of time. Okay. Because what does it mean that there can be one mouse in any state at a time? Yeah. But this time is different from for, for mouse one and mouse two, say. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what and I'm saying. So, so there they must be some tolerance in this difference that they cannot enter the same state. Sure, yes. sure. Okay. Now, what I mean is that, you know, if you made a movie of their activity mm -hmm. and you just made, a, you know, you just stop okay. it and you look at this, there will be only one mouse okay. at most of the time. Yeah. And, and sorry, and, and obviously you are right that sort of, uh, there are some time scales which are relevant. It's just that it's not yes. an instantaneous event. Yes. And that's also, that also matters in the description that we have in the exercise. Yeah, so my question is related. Uh, so how how do you so it seems that you somehow discretize your time so that you look mm -hmm. at the so how, how exactly is it 
is it done so that it, so my question is actually maybe phrasing from the previous, uh, or previous question so time is a continuous variable and of course um, there's no like if you look at it then uh, theoretically there will be no coincidence that two mice do the same thing do something at the same exactly the same time but you somehow discretize it so that you have the common common time intervals for all of the mice it's, it's just it's uh, it's not necessary really it's a technical thing that you do just you know to analyze the data so you may divide this into chunks i don't remember what is the size of the beans i think it's 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 a few seconds maybe 30 seconds it's, it's very dense actually but when i show you when i show you the theory you will see that this is irrelevant and of course this means you know when i do when i do a theory this means that i'm sort of dumping you know substantial part of these ideas right i mean it's like newton was sort of Looking at the motion of of moon around the Earth, right? I mean, so I said, well, I mean, this is not really material point. Hell, this is not even a sphere, right? Well, I mean, what the hell? We have to start somewhere. Okay? Yeah, I think even if uh, two mice try to open the, the 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 water at the same time, finally only one triggers, and that is one which was closer, and that one will push the hand. Ninety nine point ninety nine percent. Yes. Yeah. So again, I will quote this, you know, this phrase which we need forever, you know. In theory, there is no difference between the theory and the experiment, right? But in practice, <laughs> there is. So I'm talking, you know, I have to make this disclaimer again at some point. You know, all the theory sort of that I'm having and the data analysis, it assumes that the system is really symmetric and all the corners are equivalent. And and all the bots are equivalent as one and so forth. And in practice, they are not. And you also see this in the data, right? It's and so so you know, we had this discussion with my puzzle, right? So, so you know, I think you know the probability should be one fourth, but it is not, and it's systematic from day to day, and you see that like one corner is selected. Why is that? I mean, how should I know? I mean, you, you might say, you know, you, you look in the toilet, people go wash their hands, right? There are four basins, but you see, you know. So each one of them should be selected with one fourth probability, but one of them is being selected every second time. Why is that? You know, maybe the one on the left is broken and the one on the right is dirty, and you go and you intuitively go to the one which looks most nice. Simply, you know, you don't need to have some some deep reasoning why it is that. And that is the problem with the reality versus the theory. We can make corrections to that anyway. So I should be moving on. I'm not keeping track. We need 15 minutes there. And I should finish. 15 minutes. <laughs> I don't even know where I am in the time because it doesn't show me the numbers. And like I say, I'm I'm just doing this the first time. I'll just show what I what I can. Okay, so the central quantity in this in this theory is so-called the hazard function. So this is essentially the local probability, it's probability density in time in fuel, which tells you that if I have a mouse number i, what is the chance that I will go from from state j to state k at the time t given my whole history? And that's the central model. It's like the basis of the whole theory. And then you can you can make models of this. So I'm just looking at this raster plot. I'm selecting this mouse. I'm looking at this moment. I say, OK, what and is the chance? The are not Markovian. Sorry? And this that is the question. You may assume they are. You may assume they are not. You may build different models of different complexity. And then you may ask, no, can I show one of them is better or not? And again, I have no time to show. There are theorems. There is a time scale in theorem, for instance, which 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 I find personally beautiful and very powerful. The time is killing theorem tells you that if you guess your model correct, then you can rescale the times in such a way that this becomes a Poisson process with, with, mm -hmm. uh, with unit frequency. So essentially there is a very good test which, and you can, you can make some statistical tests which sort of shows you the distance from the ideal model. It, it mm -hmm. can even show you that one model is sort of better for short inter event intervals and the other is better for the longer ones, et cetera, et cetera. So, Again. So it's it's really a theory, it's a statistical theory, it's, it's, it's but it has some practical translation in the sense that I mean it's, it's not just a theory, but you can actually apply it to data and then check if your modeling is sensible or not. Okay, so again, if you just say well, this is arbitrary, then you know, you're done. I mean, how do you fit arbitrary model? You have to assume something. So we assume that actually there is a product structure, but there is there is some uh, hazard function which tells you how often do you make the events, and there is some probability density which tells you how you jump from state to state. 
So that's the has a function that's this conditional probability of right. So this conditional probability of transition. So what's the chance I'll go from state J to K, even that I just made the jump? Okay, you see, there is no K in this part. Okay, the K is only here. So this tells me I am mouse number I, I am a state number J. This is the current time and this is my history. Am I going to jump now or not? I throw a coin. And this tells me, okay, I'm going to jump. Where? With all chances. And by the way, this composition is actually fully general because if you just sum this over K, you know, these are conditional probabilities, this sums up to one. So this guy is just the sum of those guys. And so at this point, I have not simplified. I might say, no, these two functions are still arbitrarily complex. But I'm going to, you know, make further, further assumptions. So I'm going to, I mean, we can also observe that from arena, from arena, you can jump to a corner. And this is not trivial. You have four different, in principle, four different uh, hazard functions. And from a corner, you can jump to the arena with, with this uh, hazard function. And I'm going to assume that they are both modulated by some global activity function, like this gray line, right? I mean, we saw that there is this daily activity. And then I'm going to assume that there is a correction of this modulation. Which depends on the time since last jump. So this is actually the answer to what Mark asked, right? I was going to say, okay, in principle, you know, I could have the situation that one mouse jump out and the other entered, but in practice, it's not going to happen. So this is the correction I'm going to have. It's very similar actually in describing neural activity, where we have we have this, but when the cell generates a spike, it takes a few milliseconds for regenerates and can generate another one. So it's essentially appreciating that you know this is all a physical system and it can do things instantaneously. Right, so if you take this, you see this is the model that you have at the moment. So, so the chances of going from arena to a corner is just like global modulation is the correction sort of since the last time and the probability to go from arena to any given corner. And that's the probability of going from a corner to arena. And this obviously is one, because if you are corner, you don't have any other option, right? You can only leave the corner. So say, you know, this is, this is the model that you have. If you're going to fit global modulation in both cases, and then there is some probability to, uh, sorry, there's some hazard function uh, to enter, sorry, to enter the corner from arena and the diploma to go to the corner to arena. And then there is this, there is this probability. And I call this Martin Homogeneous Markov Interval Model, so a NIMI, a new acronym. In fact, we should be doing something more complicated, but I don't have results for that yet. Because the point is that, you know, the, the results, sorry, the recorder with the word. Is just more popular than the corners without the reward, right? So, you know, if you're going to a pub and the beer is good to stay longer. Okay, and you can you can feed this, I will say a bit about the estimation. So this is the fit to lambda one. This is just some model of lambda two. Uh, I mean, actually it's just, it's just sort of, uh, those are not fits, sorry. They are just some, uh, again, some hand waving just to show that, you know, how these functions should look. So this is like the global modulation, the red one, and this is sort of the, the correction. Probability zero to jump after just changing the state and then going to one. Uh, right, okay, so what, what remains is description of this reward learning, and that's a sort of a different story. So I just was talking to you about the point processes, and now you're going to look into reinforcement learning. And I have five minutes, 10 minutes. Eight. <laughs> So uh, let's assume that every mouse keeps keeps track. It is his evaluation of every parameter. Okay, so we keep tabs. Remember, okay, tomato soup in this pub used to be good. Okay, and so and then you use softmax for called softmax look for probability. So the probability to enter any given corner, okay, it depends on what in, on your current valuation times well some inverse temperature, as some people call it, just some beta I parameters. In fact, you understand that what always comes in here is just the product of those two guys. So actually, you know, this tells you in a way how much you value the sugar. Okay. If you really have a sweet tooth, beta is going to be 50 pounds, right? If you don't care about the sugar, it's going to be like 0.5. And this is just normalization, right? So, so this is the probability depending on what your current valuation of the stuff. But then you also update the valuation, okay? So you enter the corner and you say, huh. I expected a reward and I didn't get this. So you say you decrease the value, okay? Or you didn't expect the reward and then you get it, you get it, then increase it. So 
the, the updates, in this case, this is just so-called Q learning or this called Lavagne rule, is that my current valuation, my valuation after the event, after sort of entering the corner, is the one that I had before, plus some alpha. So this tells me how fast I'm going to learn times the reward I got minus minus this. Okay. So you can you can see that this goes essentially between zero and one. Like I don't care about this corner, or I really, really like it. To make things more complicated, you know, you have this like you know 50 different reward learning models. And so this is the basic one. Okay, so I just explained the explain maybe the one and the 50 should one because this is the nice. So so basic essentially tells you that you know you only update the state which you have just tested. So say you enter a corner and say, okay, there is a reward, you improve it, and you don't change anything with the other valuation. Now the fictitious updates means that sort of you update. Both options. So you enter, and you just imagine this. I mean, you're, you're going to, uh, to, to your table, you're going for lunch, and you know that sort of, you know, they, they serve, you know, tribes of tomato soup, okay? And say, I'm going for the tomato soup. They bring it to you and say, that was not really good. And say, I should have gone for the tribes, it could have been better, okay? So you sort of decrease the value of the tomato soup if you have just tried, but you increase the value of the tribes which you didn't have. You don't know, maybe they will be just as bad. But you sort of think, like, next time I should try them. That's the idea. And the dual alpha means essentially that sort of reward is more effective than the loss. And the social learning. And I try to show some results. So there is, we, we assume sort of that there is with probability gamma, actually, you don't look at what you remember, but you look at the other guys, and one minus gamma, uh, you make, is a probability that you make. A decision based on on your own experience. Okay, so I want to describe this stuff. So, how many fitting parameters do you finally have in your model? Um, maybe I'll answer this in like two three slides. Okay, okay. I'll answer it before I finish. Okay, so 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 I just showed you the models. Okay, I've been building model upon model upon model, and now I need to estimate it. So this is so so this is the set of theory. This is the lambda. And the total lambda is essentially the lambda at any given moment. So, so it, at the arena, pretty much time at the arena, and then the lambda is just lambda one times lambda two. And then I jump to corner three, and then it's lambda one times lambda three, and so on. So at every moment I have this lambda, it's denoted by blue. And then you might ask, okay, so what is the probability, given my model, of observing this specific trajectory which I got? Okay, so what is the probability of my data set? And you can compute this. And actually, you, you had this question about the discretization. Discretization doesn't show up. You can you can formally show that this is actually the product of the values of lambda at the time times of jump times the product of those uh, conditional probabilities at the times of jump times exponent of minus integral of lambda over the whole thing. So formally. You can compute the probability density of this whole trajectory under the assumptions of this model. Of course, the model might be wrong. You might not be able to compute this because it's from the assumption. But, but in fact, you can do most of this analytically, I think, because if you assume if you assume that the lambda is given by a slight interpolated function and lambda two, lambda and so on, then actually you've got just products of polynomials, and you can actually do it. You know, you can make it an exercise in the first year. Students, physics department. Right. And uh, what is further nice, you see that there are those functions of lambdas and the fees, which are separate products. So you can just compute the log likelihood, and that's just the sum of some which depends on the trajectory and some which depends on this, on those, on, on this learning view. I mean, learning is only here. And this is the daily activity, if you will. Right, you can optimize them independently, and uh, here are the results. So, can I show the results of the finish? Yeah, just be quick about this. Right. So, here's the so, so now this is the first key actually of the model. And so, it just shows again, just uh, this is just uh, a few days, uh, I think it's, I don't remember. It's like eight days, I think. <clears throat> so, you can see that you know this was a change of, of, uh, of phase. So, you know, here one specific mouse of which you are looking, it just Learned that the blue corner is sort of the rewarded one, but then it just you know here there was a switch, and then it started to you know forget the blue one and started to learn the green one. Okay, 
So this is working. And for every mouse, you can make you know this picture, you know, throughout this whole 48 days or something. So this is just the heat. The red line is just the heat of this of this lambda. So like the daily activity. This is the raster plot. This is actually the data. And here is a, so here is the the length value. Okay, so you see the day length of this value is one, and then they forget the length green is one. And this is the actual so this is this the soft mass rule, you know, for the beta which is fitting to this. And okay, and then you have those four models uh, for individual learning plus four extra models with the social learning. Okay. Uh, and the question is, you know, how do you know which one is better? And there are different models, relation rules, say a kite, information theory or sports, information theory on. I will go into that. Okay, there are those tables. I won't go through these numbers, but what matters is I don't know if you are seeing this this uh, darker gray. So this shows like which models give you the lowest value of those of those this AIC. So you see that for the data, it shows us that typically, I mean, always it's always the social model which wins, and typically it's the social hybrid, and uh, this uh, variation of the Schwarz criterion also shows the same. And this is just you know what we feed. So you ask the question how many parameters we have. So I mean, there are many parameters for the lambda because you know what we do is we assume that this is spline interpolated. So we have many nodes, mm -hmm. and the left node you get like three parameters, plus of them. We're not doing a good job yet on this actually, but for learning it's easier because for learning, say for the for the Q learning, you have just three parameters per mouse. And data are actually you know very substantial. So you can feed this over the whole time, but then you can ask, okay, but what if it changes with time? You can look at different phases. Lots of variability. Anyway, so this shows you, but you know, this is the alpha win, alpha loss, beta, so the inverse temperature, whatever. And this is the observation probability. So you, you can see that this reliably is about 0.65 and it's substantial, substantially separated from zero. Okay. So actually, this shows that the social effect is, is important. Yeah, and it's uh, also interesting for the interesting to, to see that alpha win and alpa loss, they are quite different. Uh, correct. Yes. Right. Yes. So this is the hybrid model. I, I didn't go into it. Yeah, I mentioned that, right? So that's the model which combines this sort of. It's it's the fictitious. I mean, hybrid means that I'm taking into account the fictitious learning, right? So every time that I learn, I also fix the values for the other corners, and uh, also the reward and loss give me different different uh, values. Right. And then you might ask, okay, I will finish. I will not, not show you more more results. The, the question is, you know, is this really Reliable, you know, maybe what I'm seeing is just an artifact of data analysis. So, the nice thing about this, these, these guys, is that those are generative models as well because I'm really estimating probability density. So, I can regenerate, you know, survey data which look exactly the same. And then I can, so what we did is we, we generated, we simulated independent data which, where we just had mice which, which followed the same activity but which were completely, you know, independently. Select and then you can see that they are independent, right? I mean, you see that this is 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 sorry, this is close to zero. And then we simulated, okay, and, and then yeah, sorry, I didn't show this. And, and so then it's, it's the base Q learning always select. I mean, that was the most simulation. simulation. And then we simulated data interacting, and then we detected interaction. So essentially, I'll say yeah, I trust I trust that our models are are uh, relevant and so selective enough. And just to summarize. I, I propose it for the first time, I think, a, a, a new framework for description of mice behavior in intelligent cages, which is just an example of mark point processes, which combines point processes with reinforcement learning. And I would say the main result for this experimental data set is that the experiment with reversal learning indicates the importance of social effects in learning. And I should thank my colleagues who performed the, the experiments at the Institute of Pharmacology and the uh, who really did most of the work. And uh, thank you for your patience with me. Thank you.